Hi, welcome. This week we talked about terminal value and how critical it is in discounted cash flow valuation. Let's face it, almost 80, 90% of your value comes from that big number at the end, and it's so easy to screw up. And in class we talked about the rules you need to follow to make sure the terminal value doesn't run away from you. But that's in the abstract, so you probably sat there saying, well, that doesn't really apply to me. So here's what I'd like to do today. I'd like to take you through a discounted cash flow valuation. And this is actually a discounted cash flow valuation that somebody did for this class a year and a half ago. It was actually a very well run, a very well done discounted cash flow valuation. So I'm not trying to pick on this person. It's actually for a company called Pacific Sun Company. It makes sun, you know, clothes. Uh, it basically makes stuff that you wear on the beach. And as I said, the valuation for the most part was very well done. But I want to focus in on that on the terminal value that was estimated in this particular valuation. And in the process, I'd like to give you the tools to be able to deconstruct the terminal value you get in your discounted cash flow valuation or in any discounted cash flow valuation that you see. So let me back up. The company that, that's being valued here, Pacific Sun, at the time at the start of the valuation had incredibly high debt ratios. If I move to the side here, you can see that their debt ratio right now is immense. They have a levered bait as a consequence, which is just huge, 3.97, and a cost to capital of 13.38%. So right now, if you look at the valuation at the start of the valuation, and you look down towards the cost to capital, you'll see the debt to equity ratio is 254%, and the cost to capital is immense because the company's in serious trouble. Now, setting aside the issues of whether the company will make it, this particular analysis does a really good job of coaxing the company at least on the spreadsheet, out of trouble. And here's how, here's how it, does, it does it. First, it projects out revenues, and it's pretty, pretty realistic. The revenues are going to you know, have dipped, but they're going to start growing again, so that revenue growth reflects the recovery from the bad times. The operating margin, which right now is negative, starts to improve over time towards a target margin of 5.1%. That makes your losses into profits. So far, so good. The tax rate is 0% initially because they're losing money. They, it continues to be 0% even after they start making money because they have net operating losses. And here's something that I'm going to come back to. In 2017, which this analyst is treated as the terminal year, it's still not bounced back to what he calls his marginal tax rate. And you can see the marginal tax rate he's using is 40%. It's bounced back to 24.6%. As I said, I'll come back to it. My focus is not on the rest of the valuation. I want to focus in on the terminal value. So let me focus in on what this analyst has, uh, has estimated for the terminal value. He took the 2017 cash flows to get to the terminal value. That's okay. So that's the 17,751. To get there, he started with the revenues in 2017, applied a steady state margin, 5.1%, to come up with an operating income applied the tax rate of 24.6, it's not quite the 40% because he still has NOLs carried forward, to come up with an after-tax operating income of 34816 And for the capex and depreciation, he basically made assumptions about how property, plant, and equipment would grow over time and working capital would change over time. This is something that people very commonly do in valuation is grow those items at some other rate to reflect the fact that they might not grow at the same rate as earnings. Well, that's okay. That's okay for 2013, 2014, 2015, 2016. Let's see what it does to the 2017 cash flow. Because the reinvestment is being estimated from other factors, the free cash flow to the firm that he gets in 2017 is 17,752 million. That's what you see as your last cash flow. The growth rate he's applying to that cash flows is 3% forever. That doesn't sound unreasonable, right? And first, you're, you're asking, is it a dollar valuation? It is a U.S. dollar valuation. In fact, that's a good idea to check that out. What currency the valuation is? It's three percent, not too bad. The cost to capital is estimating in stable growth is seven point one five percent, much lower than the thirteen point three eight percent. But part of the reason for that, he's done the right thing. He's actually lowered the debt ratio over time brought the ratings from single C to triple B, brought down the cost of equity and the beta. In other words, he said, he, he's saying something very reasonable. If I'm making this company into a stable company, I have to do it with numbers that a stable company can carry. You can't carry, uh, you can't have a stable company with a C rating and a debt ratio of 250%. So he's actually gone by the book to come up with a cost of capital of 7.15%. So his terminal value is the cash flow divided by cost of capital minus the growth rate, and that's your terminal value. 
So it looks okay, right? It's a big chunk of the value of this company. So here's what I'd like to do. I'd like to put it in the microscope and I use a spreadsheet that you can download and play with your own terminal value to see what your numbers look like. In the spreadsheet, what I've done is I've reproduced numbers from, from the original valuation, the risk-free rate, the tax rate to start the process, the marginal tax rate, and the cost of capital all come from right here. Okay? Then I take the operating income in the terminal year. In fact, let me correct that. It's 46200 is the operating income. So I'm going to enter the 46200 as the operating income. And the after-tax operating income is 34816 and the free cash flow to the firm is 17,752. So basically, I've just reproduced the numbers from the spreadsheet. I've reproduced the growth rate of use and the cost of capital used. Remember, there are four checks you want to run on your terminal value. Let me run through all of them. So it's a good idea to go through these checks, even if you feel you've got everything right. The first is you're putting your company into stable growth. You want to give your company the cost to capital of a mature company. So the first thing I check is whether your cost to capital in stable growth is different, lower than your cost to capital at the start. Now, for some companies, it might actually be the same. If you have a company that's already pretty close to mature, its beta is close to one, it's at a stable debt ratio, you might be okay leaving the cost of capital in, in stable growth equal to the cost of capital at the start. So don't make this an ironclad rule. But if you have a company like Pacific Sun, where you're going from being a highly levered, high cost of capital company to a mature company where the debt ratio has come down, you would expect your cost of capital to go down. And in this valuation, check off that. He's done that okay. Let's see what would have happened. In fact, I have this checklist here. If I had left this at 13.38%, you're going to see the my warning pop up. The cost in capital and stable growth is equal to your, you know, and that might not be okay. So I'm going to leave that discretion to you, but use it wisely. Now, the second number you need to check is the growth rate, right? The growth rate of 3% doesn't sound unreasonable, but remember the very simple rule of thumb we developed in class. If we're going to use a growth rate, that growth rate has to be capped at the risk-free rate. And I said don't violate this rule because that low risk-free rate helps you out by giving you a low cost of capital to keep things in check. You've got to keep your growth rate capped at that risk-free rate. Now, clearly this valuation has violated that rule, the 3%, is and I go crazy so the the message uh, I send you is nope not possible no way growth has, is greater than the risk free rate that's to show you how strongly I feel you can still override me and put that number in I just don't like it okay then I check something a little more subtle you've given me a free cash flow to the firm and your after tax operating income right to get from after tax operating to free cash flow to the firm he made assumptions that didn't sound unreasonable on net capex and change in working capital but this number now is going to be locked in forever. In fact, if I look at 1 minus 17,752 divided by 34,816, I'm getting a measure of how much, what percentage of your after-tax income you're putting back into the business in your terminal year. In this particular case, that's 49.01%. You're saying, so what? With the growth rate that's assumed of 3% and that reinvestment rate, I can actually solve for your return on capital in perpetuity because remember the return on capital in perpetuity is your growth rate times your you know your I'm sorry your growth rate in perpetuity is your return on capital times your reinvestment rate so I'm just using the algebra to back it you're saying so what so what if I'm assuming a 6.12 percent return on capital remember that's forever that number is actually lower than the cost of capital forever again you might say so what your company is destroying value, not just in one year, not just in two years, but every year in perpetuity. Can that happen? Sure, if you have terrible corporate governance, a terrible management locked in, this company can be run into the ground forever. But if you even have a semblance of corporate governance, a semblance of power in the hands of stockholders, owners who care, that shouldn't happen forever. So if it's less than the cost of capital, think long and hard about whether you want to leave it there. Let's take a different assumption. Let's assume I'd done something that many analysts do, which is you know, assume a reinvestment that is very little. You know, it's a mature, mature company. Let's say I made the free cash flow of the firm 32000 Then I'm reinvesting only 8.09% of my after-tax operating income, which translates to return on capital of 37%. You think, so what? Again, you're assuming that this company will be able to find projects that make 37% every year forever. Historically, if you've generated only a 12% return on capital, I'm going to have some very serious questions about what you're doing. 
Now let's take the absolute limiting assumption. You know what I'm talking about where analysts assume no, no capex, no net capex, no change in working capital? Your free cash flow to the firm is then going to be exactly equal to your after-tax operating income. And then I, I really kind of, your reinvestment rate is zero. Your return on capital goes to infinity. This is like the Buzz Lightyear approach to terminal value. You're going to essentially get a return on capital that's too high. It can't happen. So let me change that back because clearly this guy didn't do, I mean, he didn't make that mistake, but I think he's gone off in the, in the other direction of estimating too low return on capital. So if you look at the, the checks I run, I, run your, I check your cost of capital to make sure that it is compatible at least with the cost of capital of a mature company. I check the, oh, I forgot to mention this. The tax rate that is being used here in perpetuity, remember, is 24.6% because he was carrying over some NOL into that year. So he actually did the tax rate computation correctly, but here's the problem. If you put that into your terminal value, you're effectively leaving the tax rate at 24.6%. And remember, you have no more NOLs to shelter your income. So the tax rate check I run is if your effective tax rate, which I get by just looking at your after-tax and pre-tax income, is lower than your marginal tax rate, I ask you a question, which is this shows that you're deferring taxes. Is the, Are you okay with this? And the reason I let you have some discretion here is if your company, in fact, is a multinational and you feel it can keep its effective tax rate below the marginal tax rate, that's fine. I can live with that. I just want you to think through that assumption. I check your return on capital to see if it is different from your cost of capital. If it's lower, I say, look, you're destroying value. Are you sure you want to do this? If it's higher, I will give you some leeway because, as you know, as some companies are able to maintain a really high, a, a, high, a higher return on capital than their cost of capital for long periods. But if it gets to be more than 5% higher than your cost of capital, so, for instance, if it gets to be 18, 20, 20 percent, 25 percent return on capital, again, I'll come back with a little warning saying, are you sure you want to do this? I mean, is this is your company so special? And if you can think of really special reasons why it's OK for your company, I'm going to let you continue with that return on capital. But again, I want you to stop and think about that assumption just as a kind of comparison. The default assumptions I've built into my safety first models, these, these are models where I try to protect the users from making bad assumptions. My default assumptions for a mature company are as follows. That its cost of capital will be that of a mature company, which I said to be equal to the risk-free rate plus 4.5%, which is roughly you know, where the cost of capital of a mature company in the U.S. is. Obviously, if you have an emerging market company, that plus 4.5% has to be increased. It has a return on capital roughly equal to the cost of capital. It pays the marginal tax rate on its uh, on its income. And if you make these assumptions, I actually recalculate what your terminal value would have been. So this is just for comparison. I'm not suggesting you replace your assumptions. So in, in this case, for instance, I'd have replaced the 7.15% with 6.74%. That's 2.24 plus 4.5. I would have recomputed the reinvestment rate, assuming the return on capital is equal to 6.74%. So the, with the, in this case, I'd have also reset the growth rate to 2.24%, saying no company can continue to grow. So basically, the 33.23% is just a 2.24% divided by 6.74%. I recompute the terminal value with these default assumptions, and I let you compare your terminal value to that one. As you can see, this particular valuation, he made some bad assumptions, but they kind of offset each other. Uh, and bad, bad, not bad is a probably true stronger word, not that great assumptions that offset each other. So his terminal value is not that different from mine. But it's actually probably not a bad idea to check what you get as a terminal value with your assumptions, even if you passed it through my spreadsheet. Or it's particularly important if you built your own spreadsheet to do this to make sure your terminal value is not getting away from you. But I think it's one way to make sure that your terminal value stays within your control rather than become this number that could be any number to any person. So I hope this helped you. Thank you very much.